milestone. A petite, short-haired brunette in a sweatsuit and bare feet answered the door with a smile. Diane's on the phone in the office. Come on in and wait a minute. I'm Julie. I shook her hand and introduced myself. I assumed we were using real names for purposes of introduction. I'm not sure what made me think that. In strip clubs, I would use my name from the minute I, I would use my stage name from the minute I walked in the door. Maybe it was the fact that Julie was so prosaic. Although you never know the logic behind another girl's working persona. Maybe Julie was working a small town girl angle, but her real name was Jezebel. <laughs> I followed her down a brief hallway to where Taylor and another girl sat in a living room decorated with a monochrome vanilla ice cream color scheme. The walls, carpets, couches, cushions, and for Michael wall unit were all vanilla. The only splash of color was an orange Georgia O'Keeffe poppy poster hung on the wall over the couch. My grandmother had a small framed picture of the identical poppy in her hallway. Underneath the picture had been a quote from O'Keeffe. Nobody sees a flower, really. To see takes time, like to have a friend takes time. Georgia's poor poppies, rendered invisible yet again, mass-produced and hung on the walls of Midwestern doctor's offices and Midtown escort agencies. <laughs> Julie plopped back down next to a model thin girl with lank blonde hair. The modeling girl turned and said hello with a vague accent and then went back to watching the Golden Girls. The room smelled like Chinese food, though none was in evidence. Taylor popped up from the chair she was sitting on, trotted over, and embraced me. I'm so glad you came, she said turning to the girls on the couch. This is that girl I met on that movie I did. They looked at her blankly. All three of them wore sweats, but their hair was coiffed and they wore makeup and jewelry. They reminded me of ice skaters waiting backstage. Beyond the living room was a formal dining room that was set up as an office. At the far end was a window overlooking the city, a square of twinkling black velvet in a sea of otherwise relentless cream. Two rolling desk chairs faced a table. In one sat a pink-cheeked, round-faced woman wearing a plaid headband with a bow. It was only Christmas and a stuffed, it was only Thanksgiving and a stuffed Christmas reindeer already decorated her workstation. She looked over at Taylor and me and waved, giving us the five-minute sign. Next to her, facing the window and talking on the phone in a loud, irritated voice, was what looked like a beige pantsuit crowned with a mushroom cap of brassy hair. The pantsuit sounded like it was from Queens. <laughs> Diane, I presumed. Taylor used the next few minutes to begin my initiation. She gathered me into a corner and chatted conspiratorially. Where are your clothes? I had worn a green, crushed velvet, cap sleeve mini dress, which I estimated to be the classiest thing I owned along with fishnets and a pair of two-inch pumps my parents had brought me years ago to wear at a temple. <laughs> I'm wearing them. Really? That's all you have? Taylor marched into the closet and pulled out three neatly pressed suits, the skirts short but tasteful, the jackets tailored. I guess it was the business attire of the ice skaters. You never want to look like a hooker when you're walking through a hotel lobby. Suit or dress, Sexy but conservative, three-inch heels, thigh-high stockings, expensive underwear. I own none of these things. But you're not horrible. I've seen worse. At this point, Diane had ended her call and beckoned to me from the office. Diane's first glance at me contained a whole conversation. She was no Candace Bergen. Pugnacious and brusque, she baldly assessed me like the merchandise I was de destined to become. After asking me a few initial questions, she fired off a description of me to the phone girl, whom she introduced as Ellie. Ellie wrote down Diane's dictation on an index card. Hair, auburn. Eyes, hazel. 36, 24, 39. 18-year-old <laughs> curvaceous theater student with a face like mm, Winona Ryder. <laughs> what will you do? What do you mean? Well, will you do nurse fantasy? Um, yeah. With each answer, Ellie checked a box on her card. Dominatrix? Sure. Girl on girl? Yeah. 
Made? Well, I don't actually have to clean, right? <laughs> That's a yes. Private <laughs> dance? Diane turned to Ellie and talked over my final answer, saying, we'll do whatever. <laughs> Ellie nodded and checked the final box. Was there a box for whatever? We'll do whatever was pretty much accurate. In the peep shows and strip clubs I'd worked at, I had done more unseemly deeds for money before I turned 18 than most women would ever contemplate in their whole lives. What was one more? But escort work was different, wasn't it? A tiny misgiving fluttered somewhere under my occipital bone. Call it whatever euphemism you chose, this was fucking for money we were talking about, right? I had been the embodiment of confidence until I stood in the middle of that room in my trashy dress while Ellie checked the whatever box. I was flooded by a cascade of anxieties. What if I got a disease? What if it was disgusting? What if I got raped, got killed? What if this next step would create a fissure in the landscape of my heart that could never be repaired? You bring your ID and passport? I had been told that my interview would require two forms of ID. I handed them over. Luckily, I had obtained a passport as a gift to myself for my 18th birthday a few months earlier. The call of Paris resonated in my bones. The name alone could send me into hours of happy daydreams. I wanted to drop right down in the center of Paris where I'd drink wine and write poetry and let Paris infuse my soul with continental urbanity and sophistication. I had hoped to hand my passport to a customs official at Charles de Gaulle International Airport. Instead, I was handing it to Diane at the Crown Club. But it was a mere stopover, I told myself. Just a brief detour. Thank you. Thanks.